Good afternoon, moderators, speakers, distinguished participants, ladies, and gentlemen. Welcome to MEMA Symposium on Maritime Cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, Upholding the Rule of Law. Today's session is entitled Beyond Security, Strengthening the Rule of Law for Sustainable Development in the Indo-Pacific's Maritime Domain. I would like to invite all our guests and speakers today for a group photo. May everyone please turn on their cameras and smile at the count of three. One, two, three. Thank you. I just wanna thank the Embassy of Japan in Malaysia and the Australian High Commission in Kuala Lumpur for supporting our program today. To our audience members, if you have any questions for our speakers or even our moderator, please use the Q&A feature so that our panel can address them. The Maritime Institute of Malaysia is pleased to present today's moderator, Dato Dr. Sabrin Jafa. Dato Dr. Sabrin Jafa is the Director General of the Maritime Institute of Malaysia, MIMA. He earned his PhD in Maritime Studies at the Greenwich Maritime Institute, London, and he was formerly a professor at University of Technology Malaysia, UTM, and is currently an adjunct professor with University of Kabangsaan, Malaysia, UKM. Dato Dr. Sabrin Jafa, you now have the floor. Uh, thank you, Alif. Uh, dear speakers, uh, organizers and participants, uh, we are now uh, at the end of the symposium of maritime cooperation in the Indo-Pacific upholding the rule of law. And we are now at the final session uh, entitled Beyond Security, Strengthening the Rule of Law for a Sustainable Development in the Indo-Pacific Maritime Domain. We have three speakers today. Uh, before we start, uh, allow me to introduce uh, all of them to you. Our first speaker is uh, Dr. Eric J. Molina. Dr. Eric J. Molina has been with the Netherlands Institute of the Law for the Sea, uh, for the Law of the Sea, or NILOS, at Utrecht University since 1994, and currently holds the position of Deputy Director. Uh, during uh, 2006 to 2020, he was also employed by UIT, the Arctic University of Norway. After having completed his PhD on coastal state jurisdiction of uh, vessel source pollution in 1998, uh, he broadened his research field with international fisheries law and the international law relating to the Arctic and the the Antarctic. He has a large number of publications, uh, it's more than 100, as an author or editor. Uh, he participated in various diplomatic conferences and other intergovernmental meetings, including the annual meetings of several regional fisheries management organizations on various delegations and has been involved in international litigation as well as a large number of consultancies. Our second speaker is Mr. Zul Helmi, Mohammad Nizam from MIMA. Zul Helmi is a researcher at MIMA. He joined MIMA last year in November, 2020 and was placed in the Center for Ocean Law and Policy. He, his current research focuses on the national legislations adopting the provisions of IMO conventions. Zul Helmi received his education at the UC Technology Mara or UITM with a master's degree in law. He also holds a LLB honors degree from the same university. In the course of his study, he has taken a particular interest in the law of the sea. The same interest inspired him to join MIMA while his aspiration lies on the other side of maritime law, being a son of a researcher who worked in MIMA before, who specializes in marine environment, has familiarized him with the concept of ocean conservation and sustainability. Zulhilmi has also conducted a study 
on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction for his master's degree. And our last speaker is Ms. Aparna Roy. Aparna Roy is an associate fellow and led climate change and energy at the Center for New Economic Diplomacy, CNED. Aparna's primary research focus on, is on the politics of climate change, resilient building, and environmental governance. Aparna aims to generate critical insights on the contested science and risks of climate change impacts and sustainable development goals or SGDs in the global south. Probe the effectiveness of building the resilient of development sectors and explore the future of resilient in an increasingly uh, climate constrained world. In addition to her ORF research papers aim to influence India's climate politics and diplomacy. She has co-authored perspective from India on geoengineering published in a leading peer reviewed journal, Current Science. She recently contributed a book chapter in an edited volume, India's Evolving National Security Agenda, Modi and Beyond. Her insights and opinions have been cited extensively, including in the latest bestseller, Jobonomics, India's Employment Crisis and What the Future Holds. A partner contributes liability to public scholarship via platforms such as the Times of India, Hindustan Times, and the Hindu. A partner holds a bachelor's degree in political science honors and master's degree in sociology and international development. She was a Commonwealth scholar at the UC of Bristol. With that introduction, without further ado, I now call upon our first speaker, Dr. Eric J. Molina, to present his thoughts. Over to you, Doctor. <clears throat> Thank you so much. Um, <clears throat> Let me see. Can you please confirm that you see my screen? Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Jafar. Um, it's an honor and a pleasure uh, to be invited uh, in this very interesting symposium to give a presentation. Um, as a topic, I have chosen uh, strengthening regional cooperation and fisheries management in the Indo-Pacific. Um, and this is what I would like to cover. I would like to start with a short introduction and then focus on strengthening the global component of international fisheries law, uh, strengthening the performance of existing regional fishery bodies in the Indo-Pacific, and then enhancing coverage of the Indo-Pacific by regional fisheries management organizations or arrangements, which is a subset of regional fishery bodies. And then I have two slides uh, devoted to the South China Sea, uh, looking at options for a South China Sea fisheries mechanism. I, I, I'm sure that most of you know that the current state of global fishery, marine fishery resources um, leaves much to be desired. Um, there are many internal problems that you're aware of, uh, over-exploitation, over-capacity, um, bycatch and discards, uh, illegal, unreported and uh, unregulated fishing, IUU fishing, abandoned and um, <clears throat> fishing gear, to name a few. But there are also external problems in a sense. Um, and the most notable of these are climate change, uh, which leads among other things to um, fish stocks uh, moving towards the polar regions, both the Arctic and the Antarctic, uh, ocean acidification, um, other forms of pollution, and invasive um, alien species. Uh, these problems are to be addressed by uh, what I call international fisheries law, uh, which is the domain of international law that relates specifically to the conservation, 
management and or development of marine capture fisheries. And this is a, a, a branch or a part of the international law of the sea, which again is a part of public international law. So this domain uh, contains basic rights uh, as coastal or flag states, uh, giving them entitlements uh, to fish, uh, sovereignty within the territorial sea, internal waters and archipelagic waters and sovereign rights in the exclusive economic zone and the outer continental shelf. And these rights go hand in hand with basic obligations. And these are the three main ones. There is a duty to avoid over exploitation of target species. Uh, we should not only look at target species, but look broader. Uh, so we should or must uh, pursue an ecosystem approach to fisheries management. And of course, the, the key focus of this presentation is on the duty to cooperate and that duty exists in various um, scenarios um, for coastal states and flag states and with respect to transboundary stocks and discrete high seas fish stocks. So the uh, international fisheries law has a global component and a regional component. Uh, so at the global level, we of course have the uh, United Nations General Assembly and they have three sources, if you like. So the UNCLOS that you're familiar with, uh, the implementation agreement on straddling and highly migratory fish stocks, UNSA, or fish stocks agreement. And then every year uh, there are fisheries resolutions adopted by the UNGA, which are non-legally binding, uh, but still very influential. FAO uh, has uh, produced a lot of output as well, here are some of them, the code of conduct on responsible fishing, which is non-legally binding, and then a treaty um, on port state measures to combat IAU fishing. So in, in addition to these uh, sources are decisions by international courts and tribunals and uh, rules of customary international law. So the regional component of international fisheries law um, uh, is governed by uh, regional fisheries bodies, uh, because the global component is above all a jurisdictional framework um, um, regime. Um, and it doesn't contain the actual fishing standards, such as the total allowable catch or the allocation of that total allowable catch between participants. And this, this sorts of uh, substantive detail is done at the regional level. Um, so there are more than 50 regional fishery bodies and there are different types of them. Um, one, of, one type is regional fisheries management advisory bodies. And one of these, an example is the Asia Pacific Fishery Commission. Um, the other subset is regional fisheries management organizations or arrangements. And these are important. Um, they deal only with marine fisheries and not inland fisheries. Uh, but their main importance is that they are able or have a mandate to impose legally binding conservation and management measures uh, on their participants. Um, so such as the total allowable catch. And their importance is further enhanced by the fact that the fish stocks agreement designates RFMOs as the preferred vehicles for the conservation and management of straddling and highly migratory fish stocks. So in a sense, RFMOs are the preeminent uh, vehicles in international fisheries law. So at the time of writing, there are 16 RFMOs that have a mandate uh, that uh, relates exclusively to the high seas or partly to the high seas. So there's a layer of tuna RFMOs, five of them, uh, and in the Indian Ocean, you have, of course, the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission. And in the Pacific, you have the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission and the Inter-American Tropical Tuna Commission. And this is a single species tuna RFMO deals with Southern Bluefin tuna. And on top of that layer, you have another layer of RFMOs. Uh, I call them non-tuna RFMOs. It basically covers other species such as um, here the picture of cod or mackerel. Um, so 
<clears throat> let's focus at the global component of international law. It performs uh, various functions or roles. And so it establishes a, a jurisdictional framework with your basic rights, obligations, and objectives. Uh, but it also sets minimum standards and thereby creates a level playing field uh, between states. Um, it provides a mandate from RFMOs to deal with non-members that undermine the efforts of RFMOs due to their involvement in IAU fishing. Uh, so <clears throat> the fish stocks agreement in particular uh, operationalizes the obligation to cooperate uh, that is laid down in the uh, Law of the Sea Convention. And it basically says us that the uh, obligation to cooperate means an obligation to cooperate with an RFMO. So this global component can, strength, can be strengthened by ensuring uh, near universal participation in, for instance, the UNCLOS, the UNSFA, and the FAO Port State Measures Agreement. So at the time of writing, um, there were, um, I think, 168 um, parties to the uh, UNCLOS, and all Asian states are included in that number, except Cambodia and Korea, the Democratic Public's, People's Republic. Uh, this relates to the, uh, the Fish Talks Agreement as of 10 November 2021. Um, so the, there is an almost equal or an exactly equal group of Asian states that is parties and, and non-parties. And uh, so in total, there are 91 uh, parties to the fish stocks agreement. Uh, and this is the situation as of today in the Port State Measures Agreement, which has, I think, 68, um, um, contract, uh, 69 contracting parties at the moment. Um, so eight of the Asian states are parties and six are not. And so being a party um, to these treaties um, <clears throat> is a commitment or uh, an obligation, is consent uh, to be bound by the obligations uh, laid down in these treaties. And that strengthens global, uh, the global component of international fisheries law. So let's uh, move to the regional level. Um, so the performance of existing regional fisheries bodies can be strengthened. Uh, and the first step would be to uh, conduct performance reviews, um, which are a, a tool that most of the RFMOs today uh, carry out. And, and some RFMOs have done several of these uh, performance reviews. And so these reviews, they will identify performance gaps and um, uh, offer recommendations uh, for addressing such gaps. So of course, um, the preeminence uh, of RFMOs in the domain of um, international fisheries law uh, kind of suggests that uh, one recommendation is to transform uh, a regional fisheries body into an RFMO and thereby um, <clears throat> gain the ability to impose legally binding uh, conservation and management measures on their uh, members. I think it's important to emphasize that this is merely a means to an end uh, because the uh, performance of uh, regional fisheries bodies is ultimately measured uh, by the success, uh, by the extent to which they are as uh, successful in ensuring healthy fish populations of target species and minimizing impacts on non-target species and a broader marine environment, in particular benthic habitats. Success and performance also depends on meaningful cooperation in good faith between members, as well as between members and non-members. It is important uh, to emphasize that the obligations to cooperate, which are laid down not only in the UNCLOS and the, in the fish stocks agreement, but also in the founding treaties of these regional fisheries bodies, are due diligence obligations and not obligations of result. As emphasized in, in these treaties and also in the judgments of various international courts and tribunals, however, such obligations require states to engage with each other in good faith and in a meaningful manner. 
this, these requirements can be regarded as manifestations of the rule of law, which is the central theme of this uh, symposium. A few weeks ago, I represented the Netherlands in the uh, annual meeting of the Commission on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. And uh, the particip a participation by, in particular, China and Russia, um, I found to be uh, very disrespectful of the rule of law. Um, let's go to um, RFMOs. So at the moment, um, um, the coverage is quite good, uh, but there's still gaps in that coverage. And that co uh, the gaps can relate to the high seas as well as areas within national jurisdiction. So the, high, uh, the exclusive economic zone. So I've um, used the same map again. So if you look at the Indian Ocean, you can see that there are some gaps in high seas coverage that are left by the uh, Southern Indian Ocean Fisheries Agreement. And if you look at the uh, Pacific Ocean, uh, there are gaps here um, that are left by the North Pacific Fisheries Commission and the South Pacific RFMO. And there's some gaps here as well. So the reasons for these gaps are not always clear. Um, I know, for instance, uh, in relation to this gap here, um, that there was a lack of interest by Mexico to be involved um, in the negotiations. And therefore, uh, the delegation decided to um, decrease uh, the geographical scope. Um, but another uh, scenario could be that the delegations um, are hesitant to invite more coastal states um, because they may see that as complicating matters or there is a um, unwillingness maybe to share fish. But let's be critical about this um, um, because not all gaps uh, create a problem, right? So first you have to determine if in these areas there are um, fish stocks um, that are not already covered uh, by other um, regional fisheries bodies. And so you have to make a case-by-case -case assessment. So I, of course, I don't have time to look at gaps in the coverage of coastal state maritime zones, uh, but I presume that there could be quite a lot if you look at the entire Indian Ocean and Pacific. So this is my last slide or two slides um, focusing on the South China Sea. Um, I think this is important to uh, start out with. Um, it's important to highlight that there is disagreement among South China Sea coastal states and other states as to whether the South China Sea has a high seas pocket. Uh, China takes the view that such a pocket does exist. There are several um, existing regional fisheries mechanisms that have relevance for the South China Sea. And so these are some examples, the Asia Pacific Fishery Commission, the Southeast Asian uh, Fisheries Development Center, SEAFDEC, ASEAN, the ASEAN Regional Forum, uh, and also the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, WCPFC. The problem is that none of these are fit for purpose uh, due to their substantive and or geographical mandate and the composition of their membership. For instance, uh, APFIC and CFDEC uh, cannot impose legally binding conservation and management measures on their members or participants. Um, by contrast, this is something that WCPFC can do, uh, but it only deals with tuna and tuna-like species, and most members take the view that its geographical mandate does not cover the South China Sea, uh, at least not explicitly and fully. So I know that quite a few um, uh, academics um, have proposed options uh, for a South China Sea fisheries management um, mechanism. And I guess I thought about these and I decided maybe it's best to come with a very pragmatic and a stepwise approach. So uh, I think it's unrealistic to 
uh, start negotiations on a full-fledged RFMO, but maybe something more similar uh, can be done, uh, a regional fisheries management arrangement, an RFMA. And this is a, an alternative of an RFMO that is also highlighted in the fish stocks agreement. Um, and it can be very uh, short, in fact. Um, there, there is a negotiation process in the Arctic, which led to the Central Arctic Ocean Fisheries Agreement, um, which is the most recent example of an RFMA, in my view. Maybe it would also be unwise to deal with all target species, but perhaps start with some selected priority species uh, that can build experience and confidence. And uh, also, I think it would be unwise to start with a full suite of the usual conservation and management measures that RFMOs adopt, but in a sense, experiment um, with uh, selected measures. And I think it would make most sense to start um, with the basis, uh, which is science-based fisheries management. And so you would need catch reporting and vessel registration um, and perhaps if you go down this list that is on the screen, uh, you could become more ambitious. Uh, so prohibited species, gears and techniques, uh, technical measures such as bycatch mediation, and perhaps even area-based measures uh, to protect spawning grounds and benthic habitats or create refugia. This is all. Thank you. Oops. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Molina, for your uh, very insightful, interesting uh, presentation on the topic, uh, especially on the uh, law governing the fishing industries, which is very important for all of us. For example, we are in Malaysia, consume fish and, and fish product in a great uh, volume but we see that the fish stocks are depleting fast, either by illegal fishing or failure in effective conservation of our fishing resources. Uh, I'm sure that there will be a lot of questions uh, pertaining to this uh, presentation. However, we uh, mark it first uh, for our uh, answer session later on. Let us now move to the second speaker. Can I now invite Mr. Mr. Zulhilmi Mohamad Nizam to present his thought. Over to you, Zulhilmi. Thank you, Dato. Share my screen. I hope everyone can see my screen. Okay. Um, good afternoon, good morning, good evening, distinguished guests and speaker. Um, I hope you are in, you're having a good day wherever you are. So, and on behalf of Mima, first I want to thank every speaker, every moderator, and every participant that has made this symposium a success. It is truly a privilege to have all of you joining us. Okay, uh, for my presentation, compared to Dr. Molina's presentation, this is a bit more general. Uh, instead, instead of focusing solely on fisheries, I'll be focusing on the international law of the seas on sustainable development as a whole and the challenges in its implementation. So for overview, uh, so we'll be first uh, doing the introduction, mostly on sustain the concept of sustainable development itself. And then I'll move on to the role of international law on sustainable development and the challenges in implementing such laws. And lastly, I will give some recommendations. So first for the introduction, uh, I will start with the concept of sustainable development. The concept was first defined by the, the Brunton Commission in 1987. Uh, it is defined as the development that meets the needs for, of the pre present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. So this concept aims to connect the con uh, concept of conservation and development which theoretically uh, does, not con does not run together at all. So they want it to run as parallel as, as, parallel as it can be. And 
or in 2015, the United Nations General Assembly has established a new plan for sustainable development through the introduction of SDG or Sustainable Development Goals. And under this SDG, uh, Goal 14, uh, there's, a, there's a specific mention for life below water, and it is to conserve and sustainably use the oceans, sea and marine resources for sustainable development. And under this SDG 40, there are 10 targets. 10 targets uh, and the last one, target 14.C, it is to, it focus on the sustainable, uh, no, it's focused on the implementation of the international law of the sea in promoting sustainable development, particularly under the UN Convention on Law of the Sea itself, or as we know it, UNCLOS. Next, I'll move on to the UN Conventions on the Law of the Sea. This is uh, this convention is adopted as the Constitution of the Ocean, and it incorporates the main elements for sustainable development by balancing the social, economic, and environmental interests in the ocean. So for, for to promote sustainable development, UNCLOS has specifically mentioned in several parts of uh, the convention, particularly in part 11, for the protection and conservation of marine resources in the area. Uh, for this one, this is specifically mentioned for the bio, biodiversity beyond the national jurisdiction. And this is also the basis for the upcoming internationally legally binding instrument on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biological diversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction. And so far that I read, uh, the progress of these uh, discussions is at its climax already, but it's postponed to next year due to COVID. And for part 12, uh, the protection and preservation of the marine environment. And for this, it, it provides basic principle to prevent, reduce, and control pollution of marine environment. And UNCLOS also provides for rights to fish under Article 61, Sub 2, uh, state parties to ensure state parties are required to ensure that the living resources within the, its e, their EEZ are not affected by over-exploitation. And under Article 64, states are to cooperate through competent international organization to ensure conservation and sustainability of highly migratory species beyond and within their EEZ. And rights to fish in the high sea is also mentioned in UNCLOS under Article 116. And for for states are to take or to cooperate to take necessary measures to conserve the living resources in the high sea, and which uh, this, co this cooperation includes sub regional or regional fisheries organizations like Dr. Eric Molina mentioned before, the RMFO. Next, we move to the uh, this one is the United States Trading Fish Stock Agreement or Fish Stock Agreement as short. This, uh, this, this agreement introduced several principles to stimulate sustainable development through three approaches, ecosystem approach, precautionary approach, and compatible conservation and management measures. And this agreement is necessary to, in the expansion of provision of UNCLOS on the role of RMF, RF and rules and flexible responsibilities on the vessel flying as well. And lastly, for the agreement that I will focus on is the agreement on port state measures. This uh, agreement aims to eliminate illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing or IU fishing as well. Uh, it prevents engaging, it prevents ships in engaging in IU fishing from docking, docking, and landing their catches in ports. And it block, it tends to block the products of IU fishing from being distributed to national and international markets. And this one, uh, for this one, I, I will examine the issues that Indo-Pacific region is facing with regard to sustainable development. So for the first one is of course, the main primary problem is IEU fishing. IEU fishing has caused various adverse impact ranging from overfishing to bycatch to severe economic loss and social damage inflicted on coastal communities and small scale fisheries. And this uh, IU fishing has also disrupted the balance between social, economic, and environmental aspect. That threatens the effort towards, towards sustainable development. 
and it also has been reported that 980,000 metric tons of fish worth 6 billion ringgit Malaysia were stolen at Malaysian waters annually by illegal foreign vessels, usually from Thailand, Vietnam, and Indonesia. And in, this, in the east coast of Malaysia, IU fishing has not only affects the livelihood of local fishes, but also cause destruction to marine biodiversity. And the second, the second issues, the second issue is marine pollution. It is, uh, it is an issue that affects sustainable development through the systems of marine debris, particularly plastic, which has caused ingestion, suffocation, and entanglement of hundreds of marine species. The WWF report on plastics look at China, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Thailand, and Vietnam, which has contributed 60% of the estimated 8 million tons of plastic that entered the world, which the world oceans every year. And then the third one is climate change. Changes in ocean acidification, sea level rise, and ocean deoxygenation are all impacting the distribution and productivity of fish stocks. Continuous global warming is putting coral reefs, which are the most productive coastal ecosystem, at risk. Frequent typhoons and cyclones are destroying natural and economic assets, further disrupting sustainable development. And here I have the a uh, snapshot of SDG progress in Asia and the Pacific. So here we can see that the progress for goal 40, light below water, instead of moving uh, forward like the other progress, it is moving backward. And only three out of the 10 SDG targets, uh, SDG 14 targets, are measurable in the Indo-Pacific region because there's a serious lack of data collected and the limited evidence however is enough to show that the region is regressing in this goal. So despite some progress made uh, since 2000, the year 2000 in protecting marine areas, the quality of the ocean and economic gain from sustainable fisheries continue to decline. So next we'll move to challenges in implementing the law. The first challenge, um, the current situation in Indo-Pacific region is a direct implementation in the direct implication of weak implementation of the law itself. So on paper, the UNCLOS may look like a perfect constitution. It looks like a, the whole package to govern, uh, to govern sustainable development, but implementation was the result has shown otherwise. Uh, for the first challenge, and fragmented legal framework, framework firstly, and cost may have been the comprehensive instrument containing all the rele relevant principles for sustainable development. However, in practice, the mandate to govern this principle is very sectoral, and it is divided into several international governing bodies, such as the IMO, the FAO, and the ISA. Joint actions between these bodies are limited, thus creating risks of inconsistent and contradicting governance of the ocean. Limited framework of these bodies may also lead to legal and implementation gaps in the governance. And next, we look. Uh, we will look at the weaknesses of RFMO. The implementation of ANCOS uh, lies heavily on the exercise of RFMO. But of course, it first looked like a viable option. You have a number of states combining efforts and resources to conserve and manage uh, marine resources, but in reality. Poor, co poor coordination and enforcement of mandates has contributed further to decline in the global fish stocks. And failure to accommodate scientific advice and general lack of commitment to stop over exploitation has adversely affected sustainable, de sustainable development. Lack of participation and common purpose among state members in decision making have also obstructed the implementation of the law. And state for example, state members may object or withdraw for, from implementing any decision completely, which has been decided by the, uh, by the discussion in the RFFO. And lastly, for the challenges, over-reliance on flag states to exercise duties. Under the UNCLOS, a flag state is required to exercise its jurisdiction over ships flying its flag. And however, the discharge of the, these duties lies solely on the good faith and the discretion of flag state. 
in other words, a flag state may choose not to implement the law uh, to protect its national interests or other agenda. And there are also instances where flag states are willing to discharge their duties, but unable to do so due to lack of resources, especially in matters related to conservation and the sustainable development of marine resources. And last week, I actually talked to one of the officers of the Marine Department of Malaysia, and he has said that to implement the conventions or international law into our practice, our legal practice, it is it takes a lot of resources. It is quite expensive, especially when it comes to IMO conventions and uh, also protection of the environment. So it is to curb uh, issues like IU fishing, marine pollution, and climate change requires enormous amount of resources that is undeniably undeniable, and it is not expected that developing and least developed states can fully implement these laws without any collaborative efforts and assistance from developed states. So uh, to end my presentation, I will provide some recommendations. And for us, for the in strong enforcement of law, without any, uh, we need strong enforcement of the rule of law is without any doubt essential to the sustainable development on, in, on, in the ocean. Firstly, smile for my recommendation, states should look to cooperate more to review and update the current legal frameworks governing sustainable development and its implementation. In doing so, states should prioritize the common interests of mankind and future generation as a whole, rather than res their respective agenda in planning their next course of action. Inclusive and synchronized legal frameworks are needed to regulate fisheries, poli fisheries policies across the region. And in the Pacific countries, especially, need to coordinate in the legal field and share best, pra best practices, such as how to manage the requirement for sustainable fishing practice in other countries. Countries that already have their own national plan for action against IEU fishing can harmonize this plan into a common regional practice. And overlapping maritime jurisdiction should be treated as a priority concern as jurisdictional disputes create obstacles for regional cooperation. And speaking of regional cooperation, regional cooperation on enforcement also needed to be dramatically enhanced to address IU fishing and to improve overall sustainable fisheries management. IU fishing and crimes, because IU fishing and crimes. Uh, in fishing industries are often transnational and highly organized. So joint monitoring, surveillance and control and subsequent investigation initiatives are important to uphold sustainability of resources. States should also review existing global policies and update such policies necessary for uh, the con conservation and management of the ocean. Policies such as Fishery subsidies, which have contributed to over exploitation and IUU fishing, should be amended. So, for example, out of $35 billion subsidies provided globally to fisheries, at least $20 billion have led to overfishing. So, these harmful subsidies, which are detrimental to sustainable development, should be replaced with the more benef beneficial ones that focus mostly on improving small fishing business. And as for now, there has been a negotiation going in the WTO. Uh, so, uh, Indo Pacific countries should take center stage to accelerate the negotiations between that for to change to amend this global uh, fishery subsidies. And next, uh, like Dr. Dr. Molina has said, performance reviews of RF, RFMOs should be conducted more frequently to ensure continuous implementation of the law. And study has proven also that RFMOs tend to show improvement in terms of management and international cooperation after a performance review. And last but not least, states should look to review their national law. So uh, for this recommendation, I, we can take China, for example. China has been facing decades of IU fishing problem from its uh, fishing fleet. But in last year, uh, China has addressed this IU fishing issues to a newly amended regulation on the administration of distant water fishing. And this, 
despite the fact that they have not ratified the port states, uh, port state management agreement yet, China has amended the regulation in conformity with the agreement by depriving IU fishing vessels of access to distant water fishing and prohibiting distant water fishing vessels from engaging in IU fishing and denying foreign IU fishing vessels access to ports in China. So China has also added two new violations to the regulations, namely on violations for IU fishing and the deliberate deactivation of vessels position monitoring services. So that's all for me. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Zulhelmi, for your presentation on mainly uh, on the development of uh, fishing legislation in the Indo-Pacific region. Um, we have uh, our third speaker. C can I ask uh, the organizer whether we have uh, Miss Roy on board, Alif? Unfortunately, Ms. Roy is not available. So I guess we'll go to the Q&A session. OK, thank you. I think uh, we are slightly ahead of time. Uh, can I now uh, ask a question from uh, participants? Or you may comment. I see the Dr. Win Oi there. Uh, Sumati, you want to make uh, comments? So can we can make up the, the, the time? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Chairman. and. Um, I think uh, one of the um, uh, idea when we develop this concept is to make sure that the discussion on sustainable development uh, in the Indo-Pacific is been uh, substantially addressed by uh, Malaysia, uh, the ASEAN uh, member states, and also the Indo-Pacific partners. So in this regard, I think uh, uh, when we talk about sustainable uh, development, I think Malaysia is a uh, is a maritime nation. Malaysia is uh, surrounded by uh, key uh, sea lanes of communication. Uh, we are bordered uh, 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 with uh, the Straits of Malacca, the South China Sea, the Sulu and the Celebes Sea, and also in the northern approaches of the Straits of Malacca uh, is uh, adjacent to the uh, Andaman Seas. Uh, and we have uh, uh, interest to preserve uh, the environment, uh, the seagrass, uh, the corals, and also most importantly to ensure that food security is sustained. And um, uh, with regards to the South China Sea, I think uh, ASEAN and uh, China have been uh, actively addressing uh, the concerns on um, extensive uh, fishing uh, fisheries issues. And uh, in 2017, uh, ASEAN and China agreed. Uh, in fact, they declared, made a declaration uh, for a decade of uh, coastal and marine environmental protection from 2017 to 2027. So it will be interesting to see uh, how ASEAN and China and also uh, with the support of uh, other uh, Indo-Pacific partners have worked towards um, ensuring the, the, the sustainable component of uh, South China Sea uh, has, has got some progress uh, or even, you know, there has been any discussion and so on. So um, uh, Indo-Pacific partners, mainly Japan, uh, India, Australia, the US has been focusing on uh, the security aspect, the strategic issues, and also, uh, you know, uh, the development on the ground uh, involving uh, freedom of navigation, the passage and so on. But it will be uh, very important to take stock of some of the points made by uh, Dr. Eric earlier uh, to see whether we have sufficient data uh, on the RMO, uh, RMOFs and also uh, whether we have enough data on uh, what, what is the extent of uh, fisheries depletion in the South China Sea. I think we do have same, some data uh, from uh, Asian Maritime Transparency Initiative on, on the number of uh, illegal uh, fisheries activities. Uh, for example, uh, the encroachment of uh, uh, foreign fishing vessel into Malaysia's EEZ, into Vietnam's EEZ, and also Philippines and so on. Uh, but there hasn't been any substantial data to support, uh, to see uh, to what extent the depletion have affected the livelihood of the coastal community and also the fisheries uh, stock itself. So I hope that uh, perhaps uh, in the future, the Indo-Pacific discussion 
uh, will have more in-depth uh, uh, discussion or support as uh, how we can create a database. So with that, maybe we will move on to the uh, Q&A session, Dato. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Mati, for your uh, very insightful uh, comment on this. Uh, we have a question there. Uh, if you get to read, uh, it is directed to, I think, to the panelists first. Uh, to, can, I, can I get Dr. Molina to respond to that question? Yes, uh, I'll certainly do my best. Uh, thank you uh, for uh, Jesslyn, or maybe Jesslyn uh, received this question from someone else. Uh, uh, so it says that uh, several coastal states of the South China Sea, including some ASEAN member states, are non-parties to the fish stocks agreement. And I put up this table during my presentation. Um, and the question is then, will this impede the possibility of having a regional fisheries agreement in the South China Sea? And if such an agreement would be drafted, uh, would the agreement have to be um, consistent with the fish stocks agreement? I guess it's uh, important to start out uh, by saying that the fish stocks agreement deals with uh, straddling and highly migratory fish stocks, right? So it deals with uh, fish stocks um, um, moving from areas within jurisdiction to the high seas, and that's straddling stocks, and then highly migratory fish stocks are tuna. Of course, the South China Sea has other species as well. And then I guess a basic principle of international law is that you are not bound uh, to a, a rule of international law unless a state has voluntarily consented to it. So obviously, if you're not a party to the fish stocks agreement, you're not bound by it. Um, I guess it's well recognized that the, uh, the fish stocks agreement is a modernized, right? It's more elaborate, more in-depth, more modern. Uh, implementation of the very general provisions uh, on fishing laid down in the fish in the UNCLOS. Um, so I guess it would also make sense uh, to build on some of the provisions. Um, but legally speaking, um, so China, for instance, is not a member or, or party to the fish stocks agreement. They are not required uh, to comply with those provisions. And the agreement as such also doesn't have to be uh, consistent uh, with the uh, fish stocks agreement. Um, maybe it's also important to point out that uh, states like China um, still participate in many RFMOs uh, who, uh, for instance, the South Pacific RFMO or the North Pacific Fisheries Commission. So those are the most recent RFMOs in the world um, and if you look at their preambles and their substance, you will see that they are inspired to a large extent by the fish shocks agreement. Uh, so that also indicates a willingness of, of non-parties to the fish shocks agreement, like China, uh, to become members of RFMOs that are more or less consistent with the fish shocks agreement. I think that's all I should say. Maybe. Um, Zulimi uh, has something to add. Yes, yeah, Zulimi, uh, you want to add to that? I think Dr. Molina kind of covered uh, everything that I want to say. All right, in the case, we have another question from Dr. Uwin Uwe there on the deep sea fishing. Can, can any of the panelists uh, respond to that? I can try to. Uh, should the law follow the science? Uh, yes, I think the law should follow the science. Law should always evolve. Um, I believe that one of uh, my lecturer in UITM, maybe one of your acquaintances, I can't remember her name, uh, but she said uh, to, she taught us that uh, the law should not remain stagnant. So it should follow the current uh, current situation, current condition, and evolves accordingly. And for, let's say, uh, if we look at UNCLOS, UNCLOS has been designed in a way that it could not be amended. Uh, like I remember Professor Robert Beckman said uh, on Monday, yeah, uh, UNCLOS has been designed that way. And 
and that has caused uh, problems to us in, in when we consider the current climate change and IU fishing, that one is not has not been mentioned in the UNCLOS and it, therefore we need more laws to supplement the UNCLOS itself and that shows that the law needs to evolve again and again and again uh, as relevant as it, as, as it can be to the current condition. So yeah, the law should always be proactive. Yeah, Dr. Molina, would like to add to that? Yes, I, I generally agree uh, with uh, Tsuhimi. Um, I guess the the uh, provisions on amending the UNCLOS are very complicated, so it's extremely difficult, and that's also shown by the fact that it's never been formally amended. But of course, we have. Uh, two implementation agreements, uh, and the third is on its way. Um, so there have been ways have been found to modernize, in a sense, um, the Law of the Sea Convention, right? Um, uh, based on, for instance, new developments in science. Um, so as you know, the, the current negotiations on the BBNJ agreement uh, deal with um, bioprospecting for marine genetic resources. So, so that's such a, certainly a new um, form. Um, there are many other ways in which the UNCLOS uh, <clears throat> can be updated, right? So in a sense, it's designed as a living instrument, right? Because it relies, like Suhimi says, on many intergovernmental organizations in different sectors. Uh, it has a system of rules of reference, right? Uh, referring to different uh, rules adopted by more specialized bodies. Uh, so it's a very dynamic um, uh, instrument. Um, I, um, <clears throat> I agree also with the question that science is important uh, for the law, right? So um, fishing is a very good example um, that everything starts with a scientific basis uh, for fisheries management. And, and, and modern debates on marine protected areas show that as well, right? So there is um, a lot of countries will only be convinced uh, by the adoption of a marine protected area if it can be demonstrated uh, that it actually will be effective, right? Uh, so that it's addressing uh, certain problems. Uh, thank you, Molina. Uh I have a short question about uh, your your paper just now on the uh, disagreement among uh, South China Sea uh, coastal states and other states as regard to the pocket of the high seas. Uh, do you think uh, we we see in recent months that you know, uh, some uh, little state like Indonesia uh, have become very aggressive in uh, implementing you know or enforcement of uh, their their fish resources and they've been uh, quite uh, they've been quite a severe. Uh, action uh, uh, undertaken by, by Indonesia and respect, which is highlighted in a BBC TV with the president, uh, I think last week. Uh, what is your comment on that? You know, how do you think that we can uh, manage uh, this uh, situation, given the fact that there are uh, a lot of uh, conflicts uh, and uh, complexities surrounding the security source of China Sea? Yeah, well, thank you very much. That's a very complicated question. Um, I think you mentioned at the outset that uh, the South China Sea is regarded to have a high seas pocket uh, by some of the coastal states at least. Um, and then of course, um, uh, IEU fishing would be a different issue, right? Because this is on the high seas then and uh, <coughs> uh, this would not be illegal. Uh, but it would be unregulated, and then it would be difficult to uh, arrest um, ships. Um, I think, though, that um, any negotiations on a fisheries mechanism in the South China Sea is probably best negotiated only between the coastal states uh, to the South China Sea, and I think involving um, third states um, will probably complicate uh, matters further. And that's um, 
the Indonesia's practice on IU fishing uh, is very spectacular, um, but I agree that there are also concerns. Uh, <clears throat> and I think it's also concerns perhaps for the rule of law. Um, because uh, if you sink or explode a vessel uh, without uh, giving the owners uh, an opportunity to uh, challenge uh, the grounds on, on the rest, I think this is a serious issue. And that has also been highlighted in the uh, jurisprudence of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea uh, in the context of prompt release procedures. Um, but I think on the other hand, I think it's also <laughs> the credit of Indonesia uh, that it gives uh, such fishing activities a higher profile, right? For the uh, destruction um, that they bring along um, and that they should be uh, seen as uh, serious crimes. Um, Uh, Zulhami, you would like to add to that, you know, uh, if you have any comments on that? Uh, because uh, another issue is about the uh, cre criminalization of, of the uh, fishers, which is, uh, I think, quite rampant in this region. I think it become cause of concern in the international uh, communities. You know? So uh, how do actually we address this? Uh, uh, because I think uh, with the enlargement of the um, resources, from the uh, EEZ, you know, uh, from the uh, UNCLOS and the 82, it gives the states, you know, uh, a bigger power, some sort of uh, enforcing their uh, enlarged EEZ. Uh, so uh, many, many, uh, as a result, when there is a, a cross delimitation or one country keep on changing its territory on this, and then uh, the fishermen, the fishermen or the fishers, they don't know really where they, they are fishing, resulting in their being arrested or you know, put into uh, custody. And this has become a big concern. How actually do we address this, uh, Dr. Molina, when you have this uh, conflict of uh, interest? Um, yes, thank you uh, once again for a very interesting question. Um, I think you, one of your elements of your question uh, relates to technology in a sense, right? So how do uh, fishermen know uh, where they are? Um, um, because that would be a critical issue uh, in the context of enforcement. Um, I think science is, or technology is developing so rapidly uh, that I think it will become more and more difficult uh, for fishermen to use that as an excuse, right? So I use my, uh, my my smartphone <laughs> for navigating area anywhere really. And as long as you take a margin um, of mistake, I think it, it's pretty accurate. Um, so uh, that will become more and more difficult. Um, could you maybe repeat this, the other components of your question? Uh, About uh, a criminaliza criminalization of fishers. You know, uh, how do you protect them? You know, do we have any, you know, let's say international uh, convention or what protect this, you know, let's say they are accidentally, you know, uh, fish in another territory that they are not aware of, you know, and so they are, they, they are put into custody. How, how do we mitigate this? Yeah, so if you look at uh, Article 73 of the Law of the Sea Convention, it gives the coast state very extensive enforcement powers in the exclusive economic zone. And by implication, such powers would probably be even larger in their territorial sea. Um, but certainly in Article 73, there is a prohibition of um, um, imprisonment, right? So it's only monetary penalties in a sense, um, or at least not uh, custodial penalties. Um, so that is uh, basically prohibited. Um, so, and that would mean that, that the state of nationality of the fishermen could bring a case uh, yeah. to the coastal state for doing that. Um, yeah. As such, I think the criminalization of very serious offenses uh, is, could be a good thing. Um, I think uh, 
that's a, a gradual development in international environmental law uh, that there is recognition of the damage that is done. Um, uh, I think also in Europe, we have problems, uh, for instance, with, um, uh, with illegal discharges of pollutants, right? So, which create huge damage, uh, but often they are only fined with a relatively a small amount of money. Um, so it's also a reflection of uh, how society looks at these things. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Molina. Um, and uh, to help me for your insightful and thought-provoking uh, presentation and answers this afternoon. Uh, we are now, I think, right on time. Uh, if there are no more other questions, I think uh, I will hand over this uh, session to uh, Alif Hidayat. Over to you, Alif. Thank you. I would like to thank our moderator, Dr. 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 Sabrin Jaffa, and our speakers today for their informative presentations and fascinating exchange of ideas regarding the strengthening the rule of law for a sustainable development in the Indo-Pacific's maritime domain. Closing. I would now like to invite Dato Dr. Sabrin Jaffa to present the closing remarks. Dato, you have the floor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Alif. Uh, excellencies, honorable moderators and distinguished speakers, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have now come to an end of our symposium on maritime cooperation in the Indo-Pacific upholding the rule of law. The distinguished speakers and moderators have made great strides in offering their insights and knowledge on a very important and relevant subject. I wish to take this opportunity to thank you very much for your preparations and deliberations at this symposium. And to all our respected participants on behalf of the Maritime System of Malaysia, and I, and, and if I may, Embassy of Japan and Australian High Commission in Kuala Lumpur, please accept our deepest gratitude for your attention and participation in this symposium. I hope we have all gained a deeper understanding on the role of international law in resolving maritime territorial disputes peacefully and to ensure the stability of the legal maritime order in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, indeed, as we observe over the past few days, the rule of law is important to ensuring ASEAN's relevance in the Indo-Pacific discourse amidst the background of geopolitical rivalry. International law also provides the basis for ASEAN member states towards the peaceful resolution of maritime territorial disputes. Furthermore, uh, the rule of law is essential in assuring the sustainability of marine resources management in the Indo-Pacific. More importantly, we heard the call for actions by our distinguished speakers to be consistent in adhering to the rule of law by regional and external powers in order to avoid conflicts and ensure stability in the region. The symposium would not have been possible without the collaborative efforts of many parties. On behalf of the MIMA, I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to the Embassy of Japan and the Australian High Commission in Kuala Lumpur. However, any errors or omissions remain solely our own. MIMA is honored by the presence of everyone participating from across the globe, and I look forward to your participation in MIMA's exciting future events. Thank you. I also would like to express our gratitude once again to the Japanese Embassy in Malaysia and the Australian High Commission in Kuala Lumpur for the support. I hope you enjoyed our symposium on maritime cooperation in the Indo-Pacific, upholding the rule of law. To each participant, you have our sincerest gratitude for your continued support of MIMA activities. Thank you and have a pleasant day. <laughs>